this is especially now as we are dealing with it, um, and most of my examples are surgical examples. So we have to manage the pain before it occurs. So you don't wait for pain to occur and then assess it and then manage it. No, you manage it first and then you assess the success of your management. But the, the, the pain relief always um, uh, has, to, has to come before the pain is That is what is my most important take on the message. Okay, now this is, I understand there are some veterinarians here, however, um, uh, this presentation is, 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 is meant to be for uh, non veterinarians uh, as well, so I, I'm keeping the theory in a very, to, to, to rather simple, uh, uh, you know, I'm keeping it rather simple, and uh, obviously then you can have some further questions uh, uh, about this theoretical thing that we can bring from that. Uh, but a little bit about the pain pathway. So it is a complex process, okay? It starts with a painful stimulus, which can be physical or thermal stimulus. And now in our, for example, in our spain user or any other surgical case, it's of course as we start incising with the surgical plate. That's where the pain stimulus starts. If the pain stimulus then progresses through the peripheral nerves, to the central nervous system, and finally to the brain, where you have a perception of the pain, animal, the individual will, feel and, and understand the pain. Uh, there are several uh, sort of checkpoints during this pathway, along this pathway, where the, the progression of the pay, painful stimulus can be stopped. There are certain, there are three or four certain, uh, certain stages where we can block the, uh, the, the, the proceeding of the painful, painful stimulus. And this can be done by different kinds of drugs. So, analgesics, analgesia means the pain relief, analgesics are the painkillers, as, as we talk commonly. There are different groups of painkillers, and they have different modes of action, and they have different side effects. And they also work and affect, affect at different stages of this pain pathway. So not every drug works in the same way and in the same, in the same stage of the pain pathway. We have the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs where melatonin and barbifen are most commonly available in India. Again, I'm trying to focus on drugs that are easily available in this country. Um, and they are most commonly used. We also have opioids which are available in India. Then we can use local anesthetics like lignocaine. Uh, and then we can use certain alpha, uh, this is a known as alpha 2 agonistides in metatomidine. As, uh, for pain relief as well. Now, some of these drugs have sedatives, sedative properties as well, and that's why they can be also used as a part of an anesthesia cocktail, but they also provide pain relief. Now, not all analgesics provide sedation, and not all sedatives provide analgesia, but some do. So, for example, butophenol provides little sedation, and of course, alpha 2 agonists, they, they, they provide you know, quick sedation, but they also provide analgesia. Now, these things are the analgesic drugs. And, and this is just a little uh, illustration of the pain pathway. Uh, and, and obviously you don't need to understand the fine details of it. But basically we have the, the peripheral neurons that will bring the pain impulse towards the central nervous system to the spinal cord and then finally to the brain. And there are different stages here where we can block the pain impulse from progressing further. And these different drugs work at different levels. Multimodal analgesia is an important concept. It means that we have, because we have these different drugs that work at different levels, if we can combine their use smartly and block the pain pathway in different levels, it means that we can reduce the amount that we need of individual drug, which means that we can reduce the unwanted side effects, but get to the same or better analgesic effect. So we want to understand, we need to understand how different drugs affect at different levels of the brain pathway and how, how these different drugs can be combined by their synergistic and sort of additive effects to the overall pain relief. So and we want the best possible pain relief with least unwanted side effects. And so the sort of idea that one size fits all, you know, one shot of melatonin for whatever animal it is, whatever, whatever condition, that is not uh, that does not belong to today's veterinary medicine. Really important, doses, okay? The sun 
might have sounds like easy, but it is not necessary. That. Always you have to know, and this is again those of you who are not vets, then please always consult the veterinarian. You always have to know the correct milligram per kilo dose. There are many drugs in India that come with a label that says large animal dose 20 ml, small animal dose 10 ml. Okay? Now, as by the definition, often we consider food producing animals, farm animals, under large animals, right? Mm -hmm. So sheep would be large animal. If you're a large animal vet, you're likely to treat sheep. Even though the sheep would be smaller than a great day. Okay? Small animal vets treat great things, even though they're quite big. Okay? So we, we agree that the sheep is a small animal. Now elephants are really huge. I think they are really large animals. Okay? So if you have a three week old lamb, which is a couple of kilos in size, and you have an elephant, and you have a drug that says 20 ml is a large animal dose, okay? So is it enough or is it correct for the sheep, the lamb, or is it correct for the elephant? Okay, well this is a very good example. Everybody of course understands that it's not correct for either of them. So we need to understand that all drugs um, have these milligram per kilo doses, and you need to know them, and you need to have a good idea of the weight of the animal to be able to dose correctly. All, and also you need to know the purpose of the question. Some drugs have different kind of doses, milligram per kilo for different kinds of purposes. Whether you want uh, deeper sedation or light sedation or poor analgesia or less, you know, you have, or if you, if you have other drugs that you're combining this drug with, again, that may affect the dose. And different species have different milligram per kilo requirements, even for the same drug. A classical example is fenbendazole. Those of you who are aware of fenbendazole, it's an ibuprofen, where the dose for a dog is 50 milligrams per kilo over three consecutive days. The dose for a calf is 10 milligrams per kilo and once fenbendazole. Don't don't worry too much about this. I'm just showing it as an example that there can be massive differences within the same drug when it comes to different species. Uh, another example is meloxicam. Okay, which is a good non-steroidal analgesic drug. However, I have found that it's very commonly underdosed when it's used in large animals. Now, the dose of meloxicam for cattle is 0.5 milligrams per kilo. It's, it's less for dogs. Now, everybody is aware of the fact that uh, Ryloprenoc has been banned from the veterinary use in India because of what's doing body vultures. Yeah, that is everybody knows about that. Now, I know that the wholesale supplier from where we buy our drugs, he keeps Dilofenac in a side room cupboard, you know, he's still selling it because he says that a lot of veterinarians demand that because the veterinarians say that meloxicam doesn't work so well for that. Now, why is that? The same supplier also tells us that no, no, no veterinarian, he said us, buys the 20 milligram per ml meloxicam, which is a product meant for large animals. Everybody is only buying for the 5 milligram per ml product, which is meant for small animals. Now, I understand this is an unfamiliar concept of counting now for many, but just try to try to explain uh, 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 to me. If we have the meloxicam dose as 0.5 milligrams per kilo for large per cow, it means that for a 400 kilo cow, you would need 40 ml of the small animal meloxicam, which has 5 milligrams per ml. It, it's the same thing, you get drunk faster if you drink if you drink vodka than if you drink beer, you know, because the other one is stronger than the other one. You may get the same level of drunkness, but you just require more vodka, you get more beer than vodka for that. Okay, so that is the idea with this, this is what I'm trying to say. So uh, actually cost-wise, it is much more expensive to use the proper dose give the proper volume required if you're using the small animal, the 5 milligram per ml meloxicam for a cow, than if you use the, the one that's actually meant for large animals. The bottle as such is more expensive, but the dose required per, per animal becomes cheaper. Now what happens then is that because the 5 milligram per ml bottle is cheaper as such than the 20 milligram per ml, vets buy that and then they underdose. They give to some 10 ml, which is not enough to relieve the pain in the large animal in, the, in a 400 kilo cow. So then they feel that it's not effective. So then they will want the diaphragm. Okay. So this is important that we understand the milligram per kilo concept and you always check the product you have, how many milligrams you have per ml. And 
that makes a full difference in, in actually um, yeah, treating uh, pain successfully. Mm. And of course, uh, hopefully everyone is aware of the, of the fact that we should never be fast the whole class. I don't go for future big much detail of why it does affect cats have a have the, the liver metabolism is not geared to metabolize um, and paracetamol and that means that they can have a fatal consequences if they if they are given paracetamol. So that we should never and, and there are some meloxicum products that have paracetamol in them. So there you have to be very careful that you don't use it for small animals. So any questions about those counties? That's yeah, well, that's good. Okay. Um, so, we talked about multimodal analgesia, meaning using different kinds of drugs in a combination. And another important uh, concept is preemptive analgesia. So that we use, and that's what I mentioned in the very beginning, management and assessment. We manage the pain before it even arises. Uh, so it's more effective to prevent the pain impulse from proceeding towards the brain then to let it proceed, let the animal feel and experience the pain, and then try to, uh, try to treat that. That doesn't work so well. You may know yourself, if you have a tendency for headache, if you feel the headache, if you feel the early symptoms, if you consider that, okay, you're going to have a headache, if you take ibuprofen or paracetamol at that moment, you may get over it. But if you're waiting for a headache to become rather bad, you have to be embedded in a dark room, and, and it doesn't, even though you take the same amount of uh, ibuprofen, may not help so well. So we always have to give before. That's why in a spaying situation, for example, or in any surgery situation, we give the, the pain relief, the multimodal pain relief, using a combination of different drugs at the preparation stage already. Not after the surgery, but always before the surgery. So as a case example, I've got, I've got, I have some others that are spaying too, but I started with spaying too because I consider that as possible uh, again, there are no doses here as such because then this is this is uh, it's, it's not supposed to be that kind of extra lecture with the doses. So we start with a pre-medication. Uh, I prefer intramuscular. Uh, we use adesin, which is an alpha two agonist, so it provides pain relief and sedation. We then go after uh, the dog is sedated. We uh, induce the anesthesia. I prefer this combination of ketamine and diazepam. Ketamine uh, provides analgesia as well as anesthesia. Okay, so we're already having two drugs that work on different levels of the pain pathway, and then they're going to block the pain impulse. We also give them non steroidals as meloxicam, and it's important again we give this IV. So the initial one goes intramuscularly, but then we give IV so that it starts affecting faster. Uh, after IV injection, the, the the drug starts working, say, after some 15, 20 minutes, but it, after intramuscular injection, it will take an hour or more before we have the effect. So always, in these surgery cases, try to go for IBM. And that's why, in the beginning, I showed that video about fixing the from IV cadets, so that's also very important. Tramadol is a synthetic opioid, easily available in India, and can be very well used um, in the smooth model analgesia. Uh, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before before the surgery start, I also give lidocaine for male dogs. Uh, besides of everything else, we also give um, a pre-struggle subcutaneous injection of, of lidocaine to the to the inset in, in some, to the sign of the incision. And this is of course before the surgery starts. Uh, this is to also uh, to prevent the pain impulse from the from that area. Uh, and, and, and it has a small effect in the anesthetic consumption uh, uh, as well, so we are, we are doing that. You can also do that for female dogs. I don't do it but, uh, for a couple of reasons, but it's, 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 a, it's a good practice to do as well. And, and I know vets who will use a flash block of lidocaine to the ovaries, so they have a, another person, you know, without passing the surgery site, or a sterile syringe with the, with the vet who operates. And they'll they'll uh, they'll flush the ovaries with the with the lidocaine before they break the ligament. Okay, I don't know that much technical details, but lidocaine, like ligament pain, prophylaxis, can be used in a variety of ways in pain relief. You can also do concentrate infusion with lidocaine. So if you have a very painful procedure, uh, like an amputation, for example, or uh, removing some uh, big uh, abdominal tumor, you can put lidocaine, a lidocaine. Without adrenaline, you always check there's no adrenaline. You can put that into the IV fluid bundle. 
and, and having in a small, it's, there is a calculation for that, it's roughly uh, 0.7 ml of lidocaine uh, into 500 ml of bubble, and you let it go as 1 ml, uh, 10 ml per kilo per hour, so about one drop for two to three seconds for about 20 kilo per hour. Uh, we can we can bring the beginning. <laughs> so I think pain is a very useful drug, and, uh, and I encourage every all the veterinarians to um, study more of how in different situations it can be used. I'll be having some other examples as well of what you can do with pain. Um, uh, we can have then another example. So any 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 questions about this? Do you combine those three? Yeah. So in my in my study, I keep. No, in different syringes, different oh, syringes, different, different, different syringes, but you know, like in the same preparation phase. You know, we fix the catheter, we give induction, we give naloxone, we give tramadol, and then of course we give, uh, you know, if, if uh, we need to give amoxicillin, um, and, uh, and and then this, this is up to the use. Yeah. One question for the people, and so they say if you give the uh, anesthetics, anesthetics, they, yeah. they interfere with the hemostasis in general. Uh, yeah, there is some. Yeah, there is there is some. Uh, I, I I find that rather rather theoretical with the doses that you are using. You know, with the kind of doses that you are using, uh, you have a better you have a better pain relief effect. I think I, the, the benefits are much larger than than the than because the anyway, it's already faster, already mm -hmm. faster. So definitely, the same is going to affect on the testing both also as well as. And then the Zalazin therapy and anesthesia when we are moving over these, the Zalazin and anesthesia has a poor, somewhat poor visual anesthesia. Yeah, and for that reason I find that it's really important to have it's it's good to have some opioid drugs. It is very true. Now, this I'm not I'm not showing this as the only or the best possible anesthetic combination. The, the, the best and safest anesthesia is the is, is the combination that the primary veterinary doctor and the team knows best. I'm trying to highlight the different analgesics that in, so this this is mainly to show the analgesic combination, the multimodal analgesia, how these different drugs, yes they have anesthetic effects as well, but this is now mainly about the uh, in, in the, that we need this different because, for example, people who are using thiamental will not have any analgesia provided by thiamental. Thiamental or gas anesthesia or propofol are very poor analgesics. They are good in anesthesia, but they don't provide any pain relief. So, ketamine provides better pain relief than thiamental, for example. If you're using thiamental, you have to be more careful then in considering of what other pain relief you get. Okay? So, surely there are other ways of, of anesthetizing dogs. I'm not saying that this is the only. I'm just trying to highlight the different analgesic groups and how they should be. They, how they should My question would be the anesthetics. Anesthetics, the literature says they interfere with the most of the cancers. Anesthetics. You have
particular one. So dexamethasone, I, I don't use at all. It does have, has nothing to do with surgery. Um, uh, atropine, um, I have actually, I have, I have one slide that we can go to that now. Um, uh, atropine, yes, it can, uh, it can offset bradycardia, but which is, which is commonly associated somewhere with bradycardia with alpha 2 agonists like cytosine. But um, uh, the harmful side effects of atrophy to the, metric, uh, to the car cardiac system are more severe than the, the slight bradycardia that can be caused by cytosine. So nowadays, the anesthesiologists do not recommend using atrophy as a routine pre-medication with alpha 2 agonists like cytosine pre-medication because you may offset the bradycardia a little, but you have venture, you have risk of higher risk of ventricular arrhythmia. So with our, we when we take the, I mean, we just experimented also. You can think if you after sort of after um, cytosine pre-medication, when we get our dogs in the preparation table, their heart rate is possibly uh, depending on the dose, it will be from 60 to 80. Okay, it is not worse than that. Okay, occasionally okay, 50. I still don't even consider that very <coughs> dangerous. You know, if it's steady. So say the heart rate from 60 to 70 is, 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 is fine. It's, it is, there's no issue now. Um, so no, I don't want, I, I don't, we have actually in our med emergency medicine box, yes. So it does belong to the surgeon room. Uh, and if you have a, like a, if you have signs showing for, a, you know, that there's a cardiac arrest happening or something, you know, yes, it's an, it's an emergency drug. But I, I don't recommend it as a um, Then to orthopedic surgery, I would do preemptive analgesia like in, in the spay future. I would also consider, and I often do use like uh, lingocaine, um, uh, if, it's, um, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a high neck amputation, I would do epidural anesthesia. Uh, you know, to use like lingocaine in the epidural space as well. And uh, if it's, um, if it's a, um, a scapulectomy, I also always do scapulectomies, like I, I remove the full scapula or front leg amputations. Then I use a, a, a flask block of my lingocaine towards the brachial plexus, okay, but that I have no real brachial plexus. So basically, you take lidocaine like, about 1 ml and, and a good long epidural needle is good for that spinal needle, and you place it under the uh, under the scalp that is formed here. And, uh, and as you pull out the needle, the, the, the syringe, you end the syringe. So it's kind of it flushes that area where the, where the nerve, nerve goes, and, and it's, it's sort of the distal third of the, of the scapula where, um, where the brachial nerve is. Sorry? Brachial plexus. Yes, yes. So I, I, that, that, I would certainly do that uh, for signs of you know, the other things, but what I do for the spade. Then post-operative pain relief, of course, is very, um, very, very important in, in orthopedic surgeries. Um, you may consider um, a small dose of xylazine IV once just before the sort of towards the end of the operation or, or just when the operation is finished but the dog is still under under some level of anesthesia. So just a small dose that will provide a smooth recovery and a little bit more analgesia. Uh, uh, if you have drugs like buprenorphine, which is a which is an opioid, that would be better. But then again that's not easily available in there as, as far as I know. So then the xylazine could be used for that. Then still you need a non uh, uh like metal to come one day for, for, you know, that's now where the assessment comes to. That how long it needs, how long the pain, dog feels painful. I have one chart about, you know, assessment of pain. Outcome. So it may need it for um, seven days, maybe more. Uh, so metal to is rather safe. You can give with a higher dose, you know, what you may have to give up to some 40 days. Of course you need to observe the gastric, you know, you need to observe it. If it is having some side effects, then you go down to, to the maintenance dose, and you can go even after 40 days. Tramadol, the Sunday opioid, is a really good drug. It's about 500 grams per kilo. You can even give more, uh, again, maybe two times a day, uh, is rapidly feasible for the most of the situations that we are in. But it can be given even more than that, more often than that. Then I took this is a large table example because now I want Everybody must be knowing that the full castration without anesthesia has been banned in India. That's the animal that's born in India. So um, then there's been some questions of okay, so how to do it and, and how to do it in the field, field sedation of large animals. So this is what I use. 
Um, we start with a mild sedation with xylazine. Now, you can use xylazine to produce a mild sedation where the animal is still standing. Or you can give a higher dose and you get a speed sedation, the animal is actually sleeping and it goes down with the sedation. So depending what you want, for, uh, for the full castration, I consider that uh, sort of a standing level of sedation is, is enough. Uh, we want the animals to, the procedure is, is, is somewhat short and we also want the animals to get up rather fast and that's what the farmers also want. Uh, An analgesia then would be non-steroidal, for example, meloxicone. And, uh, and uh, but yeah, but the obvious size can also provide analgesia. And another important thing of giving the sizing is that it, it makes the handling safer for the animal and for the handlers. It makes it safer and easier. We don't need to struggle. We can use only humane restraint. Uh, then I use a local anesthetic like lignocaine, about 5 ml of course. And you have to understand that it takes some 10, 15, 20 minutes before it has the full effect. So you can't, you know, you wait for that before you go with the group of soap. And and we'll also come uh, IV as well. So this is, this is all you do before anything else. Now I have one video about this human restraint. Two pictures here. Uh, uh, sometimes I have to say now, sometimes people point here that it's not a group. It's not. It's my buffalo. This was not for castration, it was just we were having a training system to show how to rope down um, an animal easily. So obviously you, you sometimes may need to do this for a female animal as well for some other procedure. So um, I'm not, um, I didn't realize it's, it's not that. But now I have some good videos. So first one is simply just to show how to, um, let me just stop it for one second. So this video is a very short video, you can do it a couple of times. This video shows one way, again, it doesn't mean that it's the only way, but it's a very good way, how to fix the ropes to a slightly sedated animal, we're still looking on the standing sedation, and, and how to then very nicely, very easily, without much human force, without much shouting, you can get the animal down safely.
these are again drugs that are available in India. Rudolfenol uh, can be given. Rudolfenol is a natural opioid. Uh, it, is, it can be given with these doses, uh, but the only that effect only lasts for about four hours. Okay, so it's it's not um, you know if you, if you go for this, you have to keep giving it every four hours, otherwise it doesn't really work. Uh, so it's it's, it's good for uh, uh, in the preemptive analgesia before surgery. But if you have a chronically painful condition, like uh, some broken leg or broken something, um, it, this will be not. This is not very practical because it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't provide a long, uh, long enough memory, which is the, the problem with everything that we do with large animals that they have a memory options are not, not so good. Uh, chronic syndrome also is available in India, and uh, this is this is the drug of choice for uh, chronic pain horses. Uh, also, the uh, you know six to twelve hours depending on severity of pain you may need to have. Uh, in that, also is available here as well as aspirin. Aspirin is not very strong; it's a, it's a bit questionable whether it has much of an effect in large animal pain relief at all. But um, uh, it's used in some some uh, sort of initial first aid cases if nothing else is available. But uh, and of course the benefit is. Kind of benefit, I don't know if it's real benefit, but, but um, uh, it can be given orally. I mean, it can only be given orally, which of course means that it doesn't, it doesn't, it takes time for the effects, and that makes it a little bit questionable whether it works at um, all. Now, there are some other cases, and I have a few articles about this, but uh, I can, again, if, 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 you, if you will just email me, I can send you the article. If you have a pen drive, I have it right now here. Just read this article, go over and say, yeah, Management in large animals. Uh, briefly, these are just chosen some rather common cases that we may uh, have in India as well. So, deep morning, you may do that uh, even in a rescue shelter case because of some fracture or a cancer or a drug or an agar, you want something in, a port, in, in the port and you want to, 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 to cut the board off. So, uh, local and the, the light lymphocaine, I would still do the monsters and the cytosine, I would give mellow scar IV. And then the local analgesia with the lymphocaine to block the corneal nerve. That is a very effective way of providing analgesia at that point. Because, but we still need to have the important thing is that we still need to have the non steroidals to give them before we cause the pain. Because the local anesthetic effect does not provide long term pain relief. You know, once that has come off, the, the head is as sore, as painful as anything. So we need to have the preemptive non steroidal analgesia before. Lameness is, is really big, real challenge. We don't really have good drugs that provide long-term control of pain, um, safety in large animals. We have, there are certain techniques with IV analgesia, uh, local anesthetics. Morphine is, is used in some Western countries in some cases, but that is, as far as I know, it's not available in India. So that's the lameness is, is, is a very tricky thing. For abdominal pain, we can, uh, we can, we can use epidural xylosine, for example. Uh, there is, of course, the, uh, 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 the possibility that the angle will go down. Uh, uh, also, lignocaine can be given if you it. And then, of course, if you're going for an abdominal surgery, like a ruminatomy or cesarean, you can use barbed epidural or direct incision to the incision uh, lignocaine as well to provide pain relief to that area. But if, if somebody wants to school detail, I, 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 it's, it's an article that I think I have it now here as well. But so, this all is rather great, uh, but why we are so concerned about pain? That is why, and I think this is also another good one, okay? Don't worry, they don't feel pain the way we do. Okay, if we really would think it that way, then, I mean, if we would put ourselves in that situation, if, if, uh, if castration would be painful for people, then it would be painful for animals. But I think with that, all we are the kind of audience we hear, we are all agreeing that there's animals feel pain, so that's why we don't want to do that too much. Um, uh, so, but, but other things that pain does, it does, it, it just has as, as a great hole in our patients. Uh, it impairs immune function. Uh, it, it, uh, this is just some of the, I just picked up some of the, the harmful side effects of pain, uh, besides it being pain, you know, but what else the pain does. So, pain increases risk of sepsis. It delays wound healing, uh, it, it, and that of course means prolonged process, it means prolonged hospitalization time, and obviously we have 
ethical obligation to provide for many care for our patients, that is, that is, uh, that is a big, big thing. But really, again, if we think of surgery, we think of the procedures where we want to provide pain relief. If we don't do that, then we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of other complications coming up in that. Normal hospitalization time, wounds break down, because of cell mutilation, the animals will put their in pain, they start, they start licking and biting their wounds, whatever wounds they are. I had a beautiful case, by the way, I have a video of that. Um, we had an amputation, a scapulectomy amputation, uh, that was, um, uh, initially the case was that it was kind of self-amputated, meaning that some car accident related attacks, something which we don't know, some long time back, had chopped off the, uh, the, leg of the front leg of the dog from here, from the car and that stump had healed by itself, so there was no infection present in the animal. It was sort of, and it, it was brought in by the, you know, by the dog catchers to be uh, expanded. And, uh, uh, but we noticed that, you know, this, uh, the dog had difficulties in walking well because of this imbalance. You know, he's trying to use the stump of the leg, but it's not the proper leg. So it's, 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 it's causing more problem for the dog. So we decided to amputate it and do the scapulectomy and to take off the whole leg. Now, uh, there was no infection at present, and, uh, and so even though the wound is, was much bigger than our normal spade wound, but because of the aseptic surgery, because we did not introduce any bacteria in that wound, even though the wound was so big, we did not give any post-operative antibody. We only give one dose of amoxicillin IV in the preparation, which is our protocol for spade wound cases. And after the surgery, which is so we provided preemptive anesthesia, like I explained, and we provided post-operative anesthesia as well. Tramadol and metals come daily for several days. Now the wound healed perfectly. The dog was not at all, it had external stitches, I didn't do external stitches for the families. But it was not bothered by the wound at all, because there was no pain there. So this wound healed just really perfectly. And I, and, and I have this one video uh, of Uh, 
we should not be worse than two. You know, with the proper preemptive analgesia. There may be, you know, different procedures, different individuals. You you add to your surgery where you have provided preemptive analgesia, and you should not be more than two. Okay, if you if you if you let the situation go somewhere here, then it's really much more difficult to um, to take away the pain with, with any of the drugs that we have available. And also, we need to understand again different species. We have different, we have predator species and we have prey species. Okay, so dogs show their pain in a different way than than ruminants or prey species. Prey species generally they don't want to show their pain because that's sign of weakness, and they'll be they'll be caught by the predator. So they try to avoid showing the pain. So simply because the cow seems to be walking fine and not because the cow is not vocalizing for pain, it doesn't mean that it's not. If, if the procedure would cause pain for you, it's most probably because you pain for the animal as well. Uh, so, so predator attacks on, on animals, uh, uh, food and mouth disease lesions, they are still painful, but the, they, they, they are showing it in a different um, in a different way than a dog. This dog had this, uh, these tumors in the hind leg and it was totally three-legged leg. It was not put weight, it would not put uh, weight on the leg at all uh, because of the pain. It still was not vocalizing, but it was just very uncomfortable. So I already mentioned earlier that anesthesia is not the same as analgesia. Okay? So not all anesthetics provide analgesia, which is the basic. And certain drugs, for example, type and most protocol and gas anesthetics are poor analgesics. A gas isoprene and protocol are really great and safe anesthetic drugs, but they don't provide much of a pain relief. So then we need to think of the pre-medication we are giving and, 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 hope, and maybe at best have uh, opioids to get our society to provide a better pain relief in the beginning. So we need then to find out really well the preemptive and cold world analgesia with other drugs. Yeah, this we went through, so just a little bit inside the topic about atrophy. So it is not recommended as routine use because it has uh, side effects that are more harmful than, than the, the, the current part of the So not in a routine use, but yes, in your emergency box, it is a good drug to have, but don't be routine into every drug, every, every animal. Okay, we'll move on to this. So we must move on to this. Yeah. Any, uh, so that the, the use message to make any questions so far about the delivery? Those who came late, we can go through the beginning and the end And then, like I said, if you email me, I can send this. Yes? Uh, what, what might be the application of methyl salicylate as an energy? Sorry, which one? Methyl salicylate, energy what we get. Metal, is that, that is the... Aspirin, I think that's it. Aspirin, aspirin. Aspirin, aspirin. Aspirin is not, aspirin is a, uh, yeah, aspirin is not a very strong energy. Uh, in, in surgical cases, you know, it can be it can be given as the first. I learned to do that. Okay, in a first aid situation for a lame dog at home, if the owner has nothing else but aspirin, then aspirin is safer to give than ibuprofen or paracetamol. So if the owner has that, uh, some farmers in Finland they would give aspirin as the first aid for their cows, uh, or if they have nothing else available. But as of today's method, as of today's veterinary medicine, you know, the level we are and the drugs that are available, I don't really see much use of aspirin. I've never actually used aspirin, never. Uh, I, I don't, it, it doesn't substitute metals, not carbon, it's not really, um, it's not really effective uh, over the, the other choices that we have available. But if you have nothing else, yes, one you can use that, but, but it's, um, uh, but uh, yeah, not, not really, uh, Yes. Uh, when you are talking about bull castration, yes, that's really important point. Yeah. Uh, there are some studies that there are some people have done that using xylazine, uh, vitamin, and glutathione. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, using it as in two ways. One is to uh, lay down the animal. Yeah. Or castration. Yeah. Casting them. Second thing is as a standing stun. Yeah. Yeah. You just lower down the dose of that. Yeah. Because when you are talking about the humane handling of the animal, yeah. bulldogs, it is always a question. Yeah, yeah. 
because people are working to remove the nose rope and just putting it on the board. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to the question, then we are using it as a regular. Uh, if you want to clean some wound on the hind thing, because it is difficult for the bulla to mm -hmm. stay. So as a standing stun, also people are using. It. Yeah, that's yeah, very good point. So if you are if you are both a phenomenal and, and also for horse castration, the same kind of applies that with silencing, we are not able to get the animal to a non kicking state without it going down. Okay, but if you add bulafenol, you can have a standing castration, which means uh, uh, which means that the animal will not kick, but it will still stand. But silencing alone will never provide that. You know, you, you have to you, you will finally it will fall down. So bulafenol can be used for. Polyphenol can be used in, in and, and I, 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 maybe we've done it for, for horses, but you can use it for, for providing, doing the standing castration, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the In horses, you want to just open an axis also. Yeah, 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 I say for any kind of standing procedure. Any kind of standing procedure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any kind of standing procedure, polyphenol is an excellent option to have, and I have that one slide that polyphenol doses, to, um, uh, for, for standing and non kicking okay. stage, yeah. Uh, other thing with polyphenol then is if you do uh, large, uh, like I said, this is not, uh, I did not mean to go too much into sort of veterinary detail in large animal surgery as such, but for example, I could use silicin polyphenol ketamine in combination for ovary collapses or hernias in heart, which is a proper anesthesia operation. If you do the job with standing on the back and all that. So, yes, polyphenol can be used equally like in dogs in the silicin ketamine. Silicin ketamine polyphenol combination is a very useful combination. And it can be used for a variety of animals, for a variety of procedures. Neuronet and Yes, yes. The problem, the problem is that using the using a normal pain in the bowling is it creates a lot of technical complications. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that is, then you know, uh, with castration, castration is a very short procedure. That and if you, if you only use it uh, for a rather mild sedation, not to put the animal and yeah. down, but you broke it down, uh, they are able to get up rather fast and then go. But of course, you need to support their heads, you know, you need to do all that you know, so that the gas the gases come out. But if you do um, if you do an actual, if you do a surgical, like a, an anesthetic procedure, like an abdominal procedure uh, of a palm, for example, then it will be useful to put a tube and to release the gas, you know, to release the, to, to uh, avoid the sal salivation as well, and, you know, to avoid the problem with that. It's very, very, very true. Anything else?
think of differences if, if we have terminally ill injured animals that are dying with no natural death, or if they are eaten by predators. Not all the stress and fear and pain, uh, wild dogs, for example, the way they hunt, I've seen them hunting, they start by grabbing this part of the tendon of, of the deer, you know? So that is a real, so they start eating the animal alive. They start eating it before they have killed it. So, I mean, that is that is natural. That is what hot, 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 hot dogs do. It's in the nature. But it is not painless, it's not stress-free. It's very painful and stressful and cruel for the, for the, for the deer. But that's how nature is in this kind of case. So this is what we have to understand when thinking about you today. So then how to make a hard decision? Well, the five freedoms, as you're, uh, as you're aware of them, they are their good uh, starting point to assess the welfare of, of, uh, at the present. So we have the freedom from hunger and thirst, we have the freedom from discomfort, we have freedom from pain, injury, and disease, which often is, is the main thing that we are thinking when we come to euthanasia. We have the freedom uh, to express uh, normal uh, behavior, and we have freedom from fear and stress. So we need then the veterinarians who need to assess the prognosis to future health and welfare. We have, a, we have some situation, we have an injured animal, we have a sick animal. Sometimes it's good to have a second opinion as well, that's fine. Uh, we also need to understand the limitations of our treatment facility, of our skills, available funds. I have euthanized horses suffering from a bad colic because they eat plastic rubbish and they have an a, a infection of total obstruction in their, in their intestine. Now, I know I have colleagues, I have horse specialist colleagues in Finland who could possibly operate those dogs if the dogs would be in Finland in time. You know, but they're not. They are in my hands in Muti and I don't have, I can't do that. I don't have the facility. So even if somebody somewhere could possibly do something, but if it's beyond our scope, then that is that is one that is one situation where we do need to think of this next step. So in practice um, the, the common things that we think about it if you have an animal that's unable to move by itself and the veterinarian has diagnosed its immobility as, as permanent. And, uh, and uh, so that is, that is one thing. So for example, uh, uh, this is a road accident horse, a uh, foal, two legs broken. Now, there is nobody in the world who can do that, okay? Uh, so the best way is to, um, is to use an as an animal. This was a horrible case. Uh, this cow, this, uh, this cow, young beaver, was raped by young men, by a group of young men, by using some whatever, I don't know what they were doing. As they were doing this, this cow was vocalizing for pain and distress, because of pain and distress. They had put some metal pipe into the mouth of this animal to keep her quiet. That had caused this, uh, uh, the, the jaw to be broken, huh? because it was just hanging out like this. Now, at, at this, in some veterinary facility, they have tried to pin that bone. You know, they, they tried to put an intramedal on a pin to, to fix that manual. But that was, by the time it was to us, it was really, that was infected, but it was not correct in place, so the jaw was hanging out like this. So it's, it is, we can't, okay, we, we put it on drape for some time and all that, but that is not, that is not life of this kind of, you know, this, this, this sort of animal. Yeah, the, the people who did that, they were, uh, they were, um, uh, there was a police case against them, uh, against them with, um, uh, with attempted murder. They, uh, we didn't, it was done somewhere else, but there was a police case against those people. We got it as a referral case from, from the other treatment facility where it went from. So uh, I wasn't, in, you know, directly involved with those people who did that. Um, so anyway, so that's, uh, yeah. I, I don't think I don't think it's a horrible story. Yeah, that is a, that is that's the most horrible story I've ever I've ever 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 really yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, so I don't think anybody disagrees disagree that this is not the case that we would need to um, try to keep on living. Uh, also, if we have an animal that is unable to keep itself clean by going to the toilet, uh, whatever species it is, and in this inhabitant it has been diagnosed to be permanent. So this comes into this paralyzed animals that are, uh, are just soiling under themselves, they have bed chores. It is not the quality of an animal life uh, uh, to be permanent. You know, and then who has the time? 
it is some, if it's an individual pet animal with a, with a very care owner, he may do that for some time, but even, there's a limit even in those people's, you know, and how much you want to support that kind of suffering. Or if an animal has such an aggressive nature, that treatment for illness that requires long-term daily care becomes impossible. If it's a constant fear and distress, both for the person who does the treatment and the animal to do the treatment that is required, and if without the treatment the animal is suffering daily, then I think that is that is that there's no point in that. All animals that are suspected to have rabies, meaning suspected by a veterinarian, not suspected by some community member who just doesn't want to have dogs around, but suspected by a veterinarian who has isolated the dog somewhere and is able to observe the signs. If it's suspected to have rabies, it should be euthanized because letting an animal to die of rabies is a horrible death. And, and then if you suspect the animal to be killed by somebody, uh, uh, then we lose the information of whether it actually can't break. So then it should be always, is, uh, the vet should be, yes, vet should euthanize it and take the, the, the brain sample and, 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 and make sure that the correct information is, is obtained. Or you have an incurable and progressive disease, okay? If you may have a, a dog with a lung, heart and lung disease that has to be under control with medication for some time, even for a couple of years. But at all heart and lung diseases, at some point come to a stage where the medication cannot anymore keep the symptoms away. So if we let these lung terminal lung patients to die natural death, it's the same as letting them be drowned because their lungs will slowly fill up with fluids and they can't breathe anymore. That's the same as letting an animal to drown in a river. Just that it happens so, so it's more stressful and painful, you know, gasping for breath in the end. And Can it be treated? Uh, so lung, uh, yes. Can it be treated? Lung and uh, heart diseases in the early stages, they can they can be managed well with the treatment for me. Sometimes even. I see dogs with the uh, fluids bloated in the stomach. Yeah, it all, it's all of course after the exact diagnosis of that particular case. But heart, lung diseases can be, certain types of them, can be well managed even for years with proper medication. But they are all progressive diseases. They all come to a stage one day where the treatment cannot uh, do, you know, when we can't keep the symptoms away anymore. And that is the situation where we can consider the case. So not initially, it's case to case basis how long the, the medication can keep the symptoms away. My own dog back in Finland had this and he was on medication. He, uh, he was diagnosed with a, with, a, with a murmur in the heart a couple of years before it actually had any symptoms. And then once it had the symptoms, it was on medication for six months. And then it was just that went rather fast, and finally, and then it was just not, it was just not able to come to humanity. So uh, this is an issue that that sometimes causes a confusion. Is euthanasia legal in India? Yes, it is. The Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act does not exclude any animal species, and I'm talking about suffering injured animal species from euthanasia. It does not exclude cows. Oh, it, does not it does not exclude cows. There are obviously regional, uh, there are taboos, there are regional, there are cultures, there are habits, there are, you know, there are, there, there are sort of uh, actual, uh, less or more acceptance to euthanasia. But it is not against the law to euthanize a suffering injured animal of any species. It does just can't be a state law. Yes, see that I don't know if you have a state, yeah. but it's not it's the 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 the, 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 the central the, 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 the in Indian law prevention Protect Animals Act section thirteen, uh, it says that um, if a veterinarian finds and it's not word by word like this, but it says that if a veterinarian finds an animal uh, in, in in a stage of you know so seriously seriously injured that keeping it alive would be cruelty, that animal can be it says destroyed, it doesn't I say you
Yeah, finally, I said, okay, I'll get it. Yeah, we were so upset to see this animal. She was rotting from below and she was tapping her ears to say that it had pain. Yeah, yeah. Finally, it was in the history of Pakistan and it did the wildlife. Because I read the wildlife. Then it's, yeah, I think they should review the laws on in this kind of situation. Sure, sure. There's absolutely cool to see that. You cannot put down wildlife. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, uh, it's a subject, I think it also doesn't exclude wildlife. This prevention, this section only says that it's an animal. It doesn't specify what animal. It is an animal which is seriously endangered. But with, if it's a section, if it's this, uh, if it's endangered species, you do need to work with the forest department, obviously, and yeah, get all that. And, 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 and obviously, we need to respect the local, the cultures. Of people. Like, like I, had a, I had a person say that this was somewhere in Rajasthan some many years back, and there was a cow with a broken back somewhere in the ditch. And she wanted to have it euthanized. Well, she got some. She got some a lot of grease from a temple to do puja. They made. You know, you can. We can. We can be very much open for for arranging the situation so that it's acceptable to the community. But uh, uh, but yeah, it is. It is not. Uh, then natural death. So it is often uh, considered as the ideal for animals. But is it really ideal? And this is what I want everybody to think about. If we have in the nature, if we have six injured or six wild animals, it is often left behind the herd, it is unable to feed itself, and it's an easy prey to predators. What we can do as humans, we can protect the suffering animal from the natural death by feeding it, by protecting it from the predators, and in that way we can actually make the suffering longer than what it would be in the nature. So natural death doesn't necessarily at all mean that it's a good death. Like I mentioned, there are different kinds of deaths, and many of them are not uh, painless. One second. Yeah. The animal is euthanized, the wild yeah. animal. Do the other animals stay on it? You should not let it be. You, if, if you euthanize it with drugs, you should not let it be in the nature because it's poisonous. You need to destroy it. You need to bury it for, or you know, only wild animals are burned. Yeah, burn or buried or whatever is your is your facility. You don't even a, 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 a domestic animal that you euthanize. Don't leave it somewhere where the predators can take it. Because you know you have the drugs in the animal and they are not safe anymore. That's they have to be separate in the story. But what do you do in a situation where you see an animal which is something and which is you feel it's a yeah. Yeah. maybe a new horse? Yeah, you're not a veterinary doctor. Don't have access to it. Yeah, it is. I do understand it's a different situ a difficult situation. Somehow you have to get a veterinary doctor there. I mean, that is that is that because, is because certification is important. Yeah, yeah. 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 And also the access to the drugs. And again, a, a proper euthanasia is yeah. not done by max alpha or not done by this and that all kinds of you know poisons. Proper euthanasia, which is painless and stress free, is done by. Uh, a, a good, good, good dose of course, and a good dose of cytosine first, and then diphenyl, uh, sodium pentothal concentrated, um, uh, and, 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 and all these giving max alpha for a standing course will cause a heart attack, and that's not that's not painless. So that, that those are not acceptable methods as as, as for this euthanasia by the region. So you do need to uh, uh, you do need to uh, um, have a vet to come and do this. You know that's and, and I do realize that's sometimes difficult. And even in households when they have to sign a form. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. But, but there, there, are, there are situations, you know, you have like, I've been to many situations with working donkeys, for example, these abundant working animals on the roads, where you don't have an owner. So there are situations where you can't get a consent from the owner because there is no owner. Or the owners, what happens in our area a lot is that these uh, horse owners, they abandon their horses, and they don't, um, they don't want to, 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 the owner will be there, but because if the owner, if the owner agrees that it's his horse, he has to pay 200 rupees for the most value to dump the carcass to the dump. So they don't want to agree that it's their horse, so they, nobody will come and say that it's my horse. So you just have to, with the veterinarians, help, just have to go to the 
uh, uh, and, and, and you know, just have a situation but, but in that case, we have a counter. Uh, we, what we have done, we have gone to the inspector, the health inspector over there. Yes. If a veterinarian gives a certificate that is anyone, and then the inspector, the health inspector can sign on that, yeah. and then it becomes a consent form of the animal which is abandoned. Yeah, yeah. There's right, a procedure right. for yeah, that yeah, yeah. And we have tried that to like, improve the three animals. Yeah. They are having a chop up leg. Yes, yes, yes. But the animal is actually dying in a very bad way. Yeah. So in that case, to take a quick decision, we are mobilizing the local authority people. Correct, correct. Yeah. There's a way out for that. There's we can just talk with the municipality and have the inspector. There's a government rights are there. Correct. Yeah. How do you surrender the animal inspector? Nobody comes up. Actually, other than nobody comes. And as soon as you do the euthanasia for the betterment of the animal, there will be some people who will come up and they will say, this is my animal. They bought it or whatever they viewed it better. No, but we bought animals when you want to do what, you know, but nowadays, and pay them a small amount. So yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Then, then it is Yeah, I know. And I, I, I think there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, animal drama, animal drama in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, uh, they, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So. Of course, it's good to, again, if, if, if you haven't been in this sort of situation before, maybe it's good to sort of pre-plan a little bit and, and, and make sure you know the most valid contacts and procedures so that, you know, when, when you are in the situation, then, then, uh, then you can become more faster. I do understand that it's, it's a big issue also still in India. A lot of government vets would refuse to bring euthanasia because they feel that they will be blamed as being bad vets if they are not able to treat the animals. So with that, I, I, I would like to some of the vets to increase the understanding that let's just be proud of our skills as they are. You know, we are not able to treat every case in the world. We just can't. And, there is, and if we are made able to make a proper, if we understand the diagnosis, the prognosis, and we can ex explain that in layman terms as well, of owners and people are not, explain why the broken leg of a horse is not going to heal, you know, and, and what kind of life, I mean, there is no life for a three leg horse. Uh, so then, uh, or, or the same with this, this car with a, uh, you know, no joy at all. I'm sure most people will come and understand, will understand if we explain them that no, this is, I can do a lot of things, but I can't do this because of so and so and so. So it just means that it, it, it takes a lot in of In case of Indonesia, if uh, people can make ethical decision making by using a cost benefit analysis. Yeah, yeah. Giving the exactly. different stakeholders over here and yeah. seeing what are the costs and benefits and if exactly. they can ethically or rationally you can make them understand. Yeah. These are the things and this. Then the people over there, they can take their own decisions yes. and empowering yes. the community. Not very because very vet knows about it and there is some cost uh, related to vet and some benefits also. Yeah. And as well for the animal and other animals surrounding them. Yeah. So you need to like, in the welfare matrix you have to put in all those things. And then you have to weigh out the, if the cost exceeds the benefit, then yeah, definitely yeah, you should go for yeah, the decision. Yeah, yeah. And you should not be having blame on yourself that I have taken. Somebody was asking, the, what, what is the actual time for your decision? So you can do that kind of thing, then objectively you can come to it, that's yeah. decision making, yeah, rather than yeah. just having a sleepless night after doing anything. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a very good point. So if we, if we also, if we bring these costs and benefits, uh, the heart of the solid speaker is down, and then let people think about themselves now. Who is, uh, if, we, if we have a two leg force here, like, you know, who is going to transport them, where to take care, by whom, and who's going to pay all that, and what kind of care it needs, and, and, and is it really realistic? Then the decision is sort of shared by the community. That's a very, very good so, um, so, this is the final thing that. Um, from a book that I studied last year about physiology and behavior of animal suffering, I think it's a sentence. So, dying can be an ugly process, and some deaths are worse than others. Only the leaves of the trees die beautifully. And um, at the same time, I am not for human utility, I'm astonishing. I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a much more difficult topic than I had. But, but I, I, I think uh, uh, with, with veterinary medicine and with our rescue, we need to. Yeah. We, need to be, we need to be compassionate, but we also need to be realistic and we need to see the suffering and uh, what we need to do. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that uh, if you make your own way to work with charities, um, you know, I personally, if an ad come, I'm not going to go yeah. to that, come to me, it's been a very sensitive subject to my yeah. own personal yeah. 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 And uh, I constantly wait to know where to be doctors and organizations. Yeah. 
But I do also feel that when the option is very easily available. Yeah. There's a very thin line on, you know, there are cases which, I mean, say, give an example, we have a little pig left. Yeah. Must have got hit by a car. Yeah. A friend of mine. I mean, it's an acquaintance said, yeah, you know, please, and then she told me, and she said, make sure you don't get hit on. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Try and save her. Yeah. They, they, would, they would try to, normally you would try, but you know, it's a piece of thing here, and they would run over, where it's going to run. Anyway, so, a lot of people come to get the pig, start getting better, yeah, yeah we have got this one, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it constantly happens, and then they are social animals, yeah, you should release it. I yeah. have a minute, I release it, there's no problem with pig pounds, but, or just pet pounds, or whatever, yeah, it's a sanctuary, but yeah, and at the minute I release it, the other pigs will be you know, just behind us, yeah, but there's a little kind of Street, you know, yeah, I know it's going to be killed and yeah, food, you know. Yeah. And we can't. So I say, okay, if there's social animals and I get one more. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. yeah. can't yeah. 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 a sanctuary, you yeah. hospital. Yeah. Yeah. We can't. yeah. But of course, it becomes part of our shelter. And yeah, the things that we can get over. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I feel that. The minute you give, I'm not talking about, I'm not making anything, but there is an option where, as a veterinary doctor, such that when there is a thin line, yeah. when to use the and when to try harder. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that, that is, that is sure. You know, and that is, I think it's constant uh, the way, because there are times where you could try, mm -hmm. and it's lovely to see the animal yeah. find it. I think it's much more, yeah. more satisfying. Yeah. Then take the easy way because you feel oh it's gonna be a long yeah. procedure. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it is it is true there is there is invite and that invite also it, 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 it's it's affected by the facilities you have around it and the kind of work you the, the kind of other work you do. Um, uh, I had a horse uh, which had a really bad broker, which meant that um, the Entire pool, almost the entire pool fell off. Now, I, that was a, that that pool belonged to my best friend here in India, and um, and I had we started switching it, and at some point I thought, and I even told my friend that I'm sorry, but I don't think we can do this because this is going to take this is such a long process to get the pool back, you know. And um, anyway, so she had a good a good person that she was running another. Um, to try to relate to big breast which is a horse with us as an animal therapy. And, and she had a volunteer there who really committed most of her time only to look after and, and keep this, this full bandage because it was so sore. It took six, seven months of daily care from this person. And it, yes, it did heal. But I am honest to say that I could not have spent so much time of my everyday life because I, you know, only for this part of animal, you know? So it is. It is. There is a fine line. And if you have, and, 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 and if you have good treatment facility and a dedicated person for, for individual cases like that, that is a different thing. But but then but, but then if you don't have that, then I, I I would not have accepted to let the animal be in our treatment facility with a substandard care because we do not have had the time only for this particular animal, but the amount of treatment. That so it, there is a fine line, and it, 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 it depends on situation to situation of of of, of, of what we can. Uh, what we can yeah. I know that that's when you're trying to get better, and yeah, 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 it's about saving and giving the best. Yeah, so there's always so there's always a conflict. You know, I was completely and it took me many years working with parent charity. Yeah, to finally come to certain things that okay. Now I say that all this one really needs to go down. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it's a very different decision. Yeah, it is because we are, you know, culturally the way we've been brought up. And yeah. We're not being uh, not to take that. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, we're not the ones who take the same, <laughs> but I do understand it. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know. So, I mean, I even personally support even humans. Yeah. You know, you don't agree with it, but I yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. 